fair use. Open up you, my lips, and let my mouth show forth your praise. Kuma, Yehowah, Waya putso o ye veyaka, Waya nuso misaneyaka mipaneyaka. Kuma, Yehowah, Waya putso o ye veyaka, Waya nuso misaneyaka mipaneyaka. Arise up you, O Yehowah, let your enemies be scattered, and let those that hate thee flee from before thee. Let all of Yashara, Yisrael, who love, worship, and praise Yahweh, give him thanks by saying hallelujah. family and thank you welcome to into all truth i pray that the ruach hakodesh will lead you into all truth and show you things to come and transform you by the renewing of your heart so you may know what is the good acceptable and perfect will of yahuwah in these end times that this knowing that the spirit of yahuwah goes before you and guides you and leads you into all truth the angel of yahuwah is your power and yah is your power and so this is going to be a video that I've been looking forward to doing for quite a long time. Uh, and uh, it, But it just landed in my lap, actually. It's research I wanted to do, and it was just given to me. Aunt and cousin had been doing this research probably for about 60 years, and Yah caused my source and me to make a connection to land in my lap within seven, seven hours, and then we were able to talk to this family member within three days of me beginning this quest. So it's definitely a move of Yah and timely for the times we're in, Hebraic lifestyle, and especially the appointed times calendar gives you an understanding that Torah, as it was in the beginning, so it shall be in the end. Yah has never changed regarding that. And so I hope you will go and purchase those items and uh, support me by becoming a regular member so I can email updates to you because I update the calendar and the book all the time and I'm writing other books as well. So let's get into this. Barakah. I said suddenly I will fling out all you claim this land I will pour great troubles upon you great I was a young teenager I used to just sit up at night or get up in the morning with my mother and she would make calls over and over again to Jamaica to ensure that the land that we had there that recognized the Morant Bay Rebellion was preserved because she said so many of our family members were massacred and died in that rebellion. And I kind of never really heard it, but she was just always so, and so concerned over it because of what it represented. And so I'm going to go into the story of this heritage, but one of the things I want to show you so clearly here is that all these wars are connected. Even the Crimean War, as was revealed to me in other videos. And please watch my playlists of my historical videos. 
uh, because that will give you all the information that you need to understand where we are from the allotment of lands at the time after the flood up until right about now, including prophecy. So be sure to review that list. But for now, let's get into this. Shalom everyone. So I'm going to go into the history of Paul Bogle, who was basically a noble, uh, small farmer or landowner, but he was actually really quite a statesman in his own community. And this is an original picture of him. He was a very handsome man, very peaceful, stately, and uh, he had no reason to get involved with public affairs or the affairs of his own people because he was well taken care of. But he was a true leader, and what we're going to learn about him was that he was being positioned to lead the global world wars that I've spoken to you about before that the Hebrews were actually engaged in at this time. These were the wars to finally end the world of the Hebrews and for the true chattel slavery to begin. And so this was one of the last great warriors in that war and he was considered as a global threat. It wasn't just a threat in the small parish of uh, St. Thomas and the Morant Bay area. And so I'm going to let my cousin Junior tell the story like I said but uh, I'm also going to do a review of a, a just a cursory view of the story of this particular history and then I'll let Junior go into it and we'll show snippets of my interviews with him as well. Uh, but first of all I just want to say that um, he was not a slave. He, Paul Bogle, was not a slave. He had worked for uh, his own land and he was doing very well. He was a spiritual leader and he was a very powerful influencer in his own community and he was a pillar in his community loved by all considered to be very humble and he laid down his own life dis for his community despite his own wealth and success. He was actually a Baptist minister who taught a Torah and prophets based version of the Bible is what they used to say that involved a lot of washings and baptisms. So I this is what I was told when I was very young and in my 20s and stuff. And uh, Junior says it was the Psalms, but I was told that it was mainly an emphasis on the older, uh, what they call the Old Testament or the Torah and the prophets. And he taught it in Cormorante, which is a Bantu language, a version of Hebrew. And so that is the spiritual heritage. And when I was a young woman going to university, I just went, whenever I was going through a trial, this kind of voice or angel or something would always come to me and say, remember you're a descendant of Paul Bogle. Remember you're a descendant of Paul Bogle. And I was like, I was like, okay, I'll remember I'm a descendant. Now it kind of all makes sense. So let's get into this. I'm going to, as I said before, we're going to do a cursory review of the history. We'll let uh, this wonderful interviewer, Cheryl, interview my cousin, Junior. And then after that, we'll talk about the origins of the photo that you see of him 
and our family's lineage and just some of the one of the high points in this story uh, in this history and, and that is the connection to the whole Haitian Revolution. So let's get into it. Paul Bogle and the Marant Bay Rebellion. A man like Paul Bogle had no need to disturb the peace. He was a successful small farmer with over 500 acres of land. He owned enough land to entitle him to a vote, which couldn't be said of most blacks in the 1860s. He was a respected deacon in his village church, and he could have been content to just live his life. But he was a man who thought about more than just himself. In 1865, the black population, or rather the Negro population of Jamaica, was almost nothing to, had almost nothing to show for their almost 30 years of emancipation from slavery. The majority had no land or work, wages were dismally low, drought and flood had severely affected the small provisions grounds that some managed to cultivate. Imported goods were unaffordable, prices having been drastically inflated as a result of the American Civil War. So keep in mind this is 1865, which is when Lincoln was shot, right? People were starving and without hope. Despite emancipation, the planter class retained authority over government and administration of justice, which they meted out in a draconian fashion. Any incident of trespass, squatting, or minor wrongs resulted in severe punishment or penalties. In the parish of St. Thomas East, Bogle was an ex-slave who had become a successful small farmer and landowner. The ownership ship of land gave him the right to vote, a right held by only 106 persons in the parish. He was connected both religiously and politically to George William Gordon, a mixed-race Jamaican businessman and a landowner who was a harsh critic of the island's governor and an advocate for the rights of black Jamaicans, Negro Jamaicans. Gordon established native Baptist chapels in Kingston and St. Thomas and ordained Paul Bogle as a deacon in the church. Bogle, in turn, established his own chapel in his village, Stony Gut, in the hills of St. Thomas. The support of Bogle and his group of native Baptists was pivotal in George William Gordon being elected to represent St. Thomas on the National Assembly. In addition to its religious functions, Bogle's chapel became a center for political activity and, some believe, military training. Bogle began to organize demonstrations against injustices in the legal system. In August of 1865, Paul Bogle and some of his followers marched over 50 miles from Stony Gut to, Saint, to Spanish Town, the capital of Jamaica at that time. Governor Eyre refused to meet with him. Their protesters headed back to Stony Gut and began to plan their own court system, appointing magistrates and other officials. Hearing of these plans, the police had two of Bogle's men arrested on spurious charges. On October 7th, Bogle and a group of his supporters marched out to the Morant Bay Courthouse, where the two men were being tried. They surrounded the courthouse and attempted to dis disrupt the proceedings with a loud but peaceful protest. A scrimmage with the police ensued, providing just the excuse the authorities needed to issue an a warrant arrest for Paul Bogle. October 10th, the police tried to arrest Bogle at Stony Gut. The villagers prevented the arrest from taking place. The police fed, fled back to Morant Bay, bearing the news that Bogle's group planned to march on the town the next day. The governor's representative in the parish, the Custos, called out the volunteer militia and requested additional military assistance from the governor. October 11th, Bogle and 400 supporters marched into Morant Bay. They raided the police station for arms, attacked the courthouse where the local council was having a meeting, and ensuing violence left Custos and 17 other officials and soldiers dead along with seven of Bogle's supporters. Troops sent the, by the governor arrived the next day. Black soldiers of the 1st West India Regiment under white officers arrived by ship. Then white soldiers from Newcastle and St. Andrew arrived on foot. 
even some maroons to the disgust of the Negro population joined in the vicious fight against Paul Bogle's men. The protests spread violently through St. Thomas. The authorities feared that they would soon affect the whole island. So like Taki's rebellion, right? Please watch that in my Hebrew World Wars video. Martial law was declared on October 13th, pretty much giving the army freedom to do whatever they liked. The rebellion and protesters were brutally crushed. Paul Bogle escaped to the hills. Governor Eyre used the uprising as an opportunity to eliminate his chief political critic, George William Gordon. Gordon, who had been in Kingston during all the events leading up to the rebellion, was arrested, charged with treason and complicity with the protesters. He was sentenced to death and hanged on October 23rd. Bogle was caught and hanged in front of the courthouse on October 25th. In the weeks that followed, over 430 men and women over 430 men and women were killed by soldiers or executed by court-martial. Another 600 men and women were flogged. Over a thousand homes and farms burnt to the ground. People with the name Bogle and others with names associated with the rebellion were forced to change their names in order to avoid persecution by the authorities and resentment from fellow citizens who blamed them for the troubles experienced by the parish. For many years, the name Bogle was hated by many. The ferocious crushing of the Morant Bay Rebellion served to focus British attention on the atrocious social conditions in Jamaica. Governor Eyre was recalled to England. The local assembly, which had been Jamaica's independent law-making body, surrendered its authority to the Crown. The island was placed under direct rule from Britain, known as Crown Colony Government. Measures were taken to improve the conditions on the island and the new governor was cha charged to represent the interests of all citizens. It was only after independence in 1962, along with the perspective allowed by the passage of time, that the contribution of Paul Bogle to the development of the in independent Jamaica was fully recognized. When the order of a national hero was established in 1969, the right excellent Paul Bogle was one of five individuals named as National Heroes of Jamaica, a well-deserved honor. So that's the official story. So now we're going to look at the family oral history of the rebellion, as well as uh, given through books from the perspective of Junior Bailey. And Paul Bogle himself was not a slave, he was a free man and uh -huh. he had vast amounts of land. And okay. even this week, I got in an argument with somebody that was saying that Paul Bogle was a slave. I said, No, he wasn't a slave, he was born a free man and he was a man of means. And there's other stories slightly digressing but covering other things for your benefit as well. There's something, a story that started in the Jamaican Gleaner about seven, eight, nine, maybe ten years ago. Okay. That the image of Paul Bogle is not Paul Bogle, it's of somebody that invented the Hoffman Press by the name of Jenkins. I don't know if you're familiar with the story. This, this image is what you're talking about, the one that's on the $2 bill? Yeah. Yeah, they reckon so, that is not Paul Bogle. It is Paul mm. Bogle. It is Somebody, him. But no. I actually wrote to the Jamaican Gleaner through a friend to rubbish the story because the picture of... Um, there was a Jenkins, but I think he died about 1822. Mm, and okay. the attire, what Paul Bogle wears, is of the time because people right. can like pinpoint dates to the type of clothing worn. Yeah. And the type of yeah. clothing what Paul Bogle wore was yeah. clothing that was of the 1850s onwards. Yeah. Right? Where yeah. plus the photograph at the time was supposed to be Jenkins in 1822. Yeah. Like I said, there was a Jenkins that existed, but he died in 1822. And okay. when he died, I believe he was in his 60s. And at that time, they didn't have the photographic apparatus, what they later had after the 1850s, which okay. completely rubbishes the story of any 
picture being Jenkins and not Bogle, but because I've had to debate it many a times. Well, it's like I said, they often come up with these false narratives to try to denigrate the biggest or greatest heroes, or they conflate their identities into a lesser person in order to minimize their impact on history and to, for example, hide the idea that he was a free man and also to obscure, I think, the history of the indentured servitude, which comes out of biblical law. So you have seven years of servitude if you sell yourself to your brother into slavery. So both Bogles may have very well been black. The one might have been an Edomite and the other uh, family who eventually got their freedom and freed themselves might have been the Bogle of the slave history. And so, and you see how handsome Paul Bogle is, and he was obviously an aristocrat, right? Because he was a free man and he eventually is like a general. Of course, they want to dem denigrate his image. I mean, you look at the images of Taki from the Cormorante, um, Coromante rebellions, who, who was also, you know, um, the same stock. And they create these images of him and they put a little pot belly on him in this image. And even, even Kujo of the Maroons, they make him into this strange little waddling, odd figure of a man. And so this is the kind of stuff they do to denigrate the history of the diaspora and their fights against the colonialist system and the, the Gentiles and Canaanites. This is okay. supposed to be the, the one that was done off of Baggins oh, right. that was made by Edna Manley's Edna wife, right. who is a, a, right. Jewess, a Jewish woman. And this is what the image she made. She gave him a giant forehead with an eagle in it. This very weird. And his eyes yeah. look all strange. I mean, I saw photos of Baggins. He doesn't look like it this. It doesn't really look like kind of, but it doesn't it's really so look like yeah. I just think it's demonic. And then you look at this and his skin looks like, this is another version of it. And his skin looks like snake skin. And he looks like an alien. I like it, it was, and somebody said to me who told me about it because I never seen it before because I'd only seen the one based on the real one, and he said he said yeah everybody in Jamaica said they're ca they're he's castrating himself in this photo, and they said they don't like it and I was like what is he talking about so I looked it up something and like, like that and the upside down cross or something like that the sword to represent an upside down cross I heard yeah. that later yeah I and then the moon them. it's got the moon too the moon. Yeah, I don't like it's remember. So, that. It's very, it's like a, a defaming of the image, and it's so badly done and out of proportion too. Because Bergen is who did show me around and give me the history and showed me where the family members was buried, and okay. I met him the year before he died. Because when I went back out to Jamaica, I was told that he died the following, the, the previous year. Unfortunately, yeah. there's a lot of bad-minded people out there what causes yeah. co confusion. And it's like yeah. they're trying to discredit the name and the hero. Yeah. yeah. And it's not, and, and like you said earlier on about um, them covering and miswriting and so on and so on, a lot of that takes place. In Greetings and welcome to this week's edition of Bias Magazine with Caribbean Gateway. And we're not in the studio this week, we are outside. And I'm here with Junior Bogle, a descendant of Paul Bogle. So we're here to sort of commemorate and talk about that history. Junior, please just tell us a brief history of who you are. Good morning, greetings, Cheryl. I'm, <laughs> I'm Junior Bogle. Um, part of the Bogle family of St. Thomas in Jamaica, whose heritage goes back and beyond Paul Bogle. We're actually the east side of Jamaica, the Morant Bay family of Bogles, spread out, dispersed. Um, my ancestry goes back beyond Paul Bogle to the African Coromante tribe, which is also part of who Paul Bogle came from. And who we all know as the Maroons, they were actually all Coromantes, the greater majority of them also. So, unfortunate in the end that 
the people that uh, captured Paul Wogwood, they didn't actually capture him. He gave himself up to them. They were his own kindred. Mm -hmm. You know, but that's something we'll talk about later down. But I'm actually, like I said, the um, Hartis yellow side of the St. Thomas Bogle strain. And my father came here in the 50s, as many Jamaicans did. And I was actually born here in London, northwest London, you know. Okay. So Coromantes, where are they from in Africa? That's the Gold Coast of Africa, okay. which is uh, known as Ghana. Growing up, my father always told us that we were from Africa and that we were from the people of the Gold Coast. But years ago, through further research, I actually managed to dig down and actually establish the tribe within the Gold Coast of Africa, mm -hmm. who we actually came from. And like I said, that's the Coromantes. They were like uh, military people of precision, timing, and expertise in wow. military, you know, warfare, but very disciplined people. So Paul Bogle within him had that bloodline. Okay. You know? So let's talk about Paul Bogle then. So he lived when? He lived during the period of the 20s up until the unfortunate time of the uprising which he led and was subsequently hanged mm. on the... He gave himself up a few weeks after the um, rebellion which he started on the 11th of October 1865 after various communications, letters, what he actually wrote to Queen Victoria. There was various um, disgruntlements taking place like... Um, Poverty, health care, um, land reforms that weren't really in people's favour. After um, the abolition of slavery, people were given grants and the options to buy land. And a lot of the people actually bought land. Transpired that the paper, what they had for the land, weren't worth the paper it was written on. So they were duped into buying things that was worthless. Right. And the social conditions, the poverty working hours upon end in more often than in many cases not actually being paid for the work what they were being done and just tr being treated um very badly in fact like i said no different to what we know today of how people in south africa mm. were treated so uh, to make a parallel or to draw a parallel of what was happening if you think back to the times of what mandela led his people and subsequently ended up in jail. There was no real difference to what was going on in other parts of the uh, Western Globe, be Jamaica, Morant Bay, 150 years ago, mm. or the present moment in time. Okay. We've come a long way, but we've still got a long <laughs> got way a to long go. A long way to go. Yeah, so I'm trying to understand the context as well of, of the time. So we've got 1865, Correct. 11th of October is when the, the rebellion was started. Correct. Um, and this is, what, nearly 30 years after emancipation. Correct. So this is a long time of sort of things being quite unfair. Actually 60 years, because yeah. emancipation was 1807, but the abolition of slavery took a further revolt by Brother Sam Sharp yeah. to, for the powers to be to actually acknowledge what was happening and they couldn't continue what they were doing. So Paul Bogle, one of our family members, going back to 1865 in Jamaica, took it upon himself with the support of his family and friends of St. Thomas in Jamaica, which is actually the east side of Jamaica. Jamaica was so nice, most place was named twice. Ah. <laughs> right, but now there's only known St. Thomas in the east which is now just St. Thomas. But after um, numerous petitions against the impoverished conditions of the people in Jamaica and social injustice and living conditions, Paul Bogle wrote to the Governor General Erie petitioning the plight of his people as well as writing letters to Queen Victoria and receiving replies which was really one of disrespect yes yeah, so how much of the paperwork these letters to queen victoria and different letters of court case the, the court and events and so on 
have you seen or had um, reference to to kind of understand what was really going on on the ground at the time? Have you had a look at any of the well, newspapers well, and so on? This was like family oral history handed right. down to me. Mm-hmm. And then many years ago, in my formative youth, so I've actually had a copy of one of the letters, what he okay. actually wrote. But unfortunately, with the passage of time, that was misplaced amongst yeah. many documentation. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Which is a bit of a shame. Unfortunately. Yeah, but still, um, at least you've had that oral yeah, history. We're talking so about you some know. 40 odd years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, you know, the paper's surviving all that time as well. Okay, so I want to understand a bit more about the rebellion itself. So it started on the 11th. 11th of October. But prior to that, there was a series of meetings, what was held, known as the Underhill Meetings. Okay which would be equivalent to like today's sort of council meetings right? where you had like a group of um, locals as well as businessmen yeah. hearing their grievances and what the people were up against. Right. And Paul Bogle actually was a Baptist deacon yes. ordained by William Gordon. So he was quite a leader anyway. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And he had his own church in Stony Gut in which he sermons, he actually was educating Mm -hmm. and teaching the people ways of life as well as their original Mm. African tongue. So his sermons was in his African tongue, which the powers that be did not Uh, like. I was going to say, how do you you think that the officials, you know, the, the British, so on, felt? Because I'm not sure how much presence they still have in Jamaica at this time. Um, and as you're saying, they're duped out of land and so on. So there must be something going on there to, to, to hold on to the Correct. the empires and so Correct. on. Yeah. So just, um, I suppose, get, wanted to get a feel for how much resistance there was towards him. I mean, they're resisting the system, but how much resistance was there towards him? Well, he was rather low key and his people embraced him. And as an individual, he was a very quiet, humble unassuming man but mm. when he stood up in his pulpit in church he rose with um okay a presence correct. yeah 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 and jamaica's quite a big space so how far do you think his his word got about this rebellion it traveled because he also had there was also family in other parts of jamaica like manchester and actually during the course of the rebellion he feared for his pregnant wife mary right and Prior to the rebellion, he actually sent her to stay with other family members on the north side of Jamaica, okay. fearing what would happen to his um, wife and his unborn child. Mm-hmm. Wow, 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 wow. Okay, so let's take it now to the day, that, ha- that what's happened in those few days up to the 24th. Can How much of that history do you know? Well, there was a few things what happened and like meetings what I, previously said was held in um, Stony Gut, the underhill meetings, Mm -hmm. and um, as a result of which he took it upon himself to walk from um, St. Thomas in the east to the governor's residence in Spanish Town, which Mm -hmm. was like a long, long walk. We're probably talking about give or take... (sighs) Some, what, 20-odd miles, if not more. Mm, so that's quite a walk. And this is in blazing heat. Yes. You yes. know, and he actually took the one pair of shoes, what he had on, off, yeah. wrapped them around his neck, yeah. which was a story, to, oral history given to us through our family. After numerous petitions and a protest march to the governor's residence in Spanish Town, and back petitioned the governor general who refused to acknowledge him and basically chased him away and ran him from his front door mm. and he actually walked back to stony got from spanish town where everyone was excited waiting for the news and saying like brother paul brother paul what's the news what's the news mm. what do you have for okay, us okay. and he said to them my brothers my sister and there's no news and for a change to come blood have to run and it's time to put shoulders to the wheel and basically this was like a long long road what was a long drawn out road of peaceful protests petitions meetings after meetings after meetings which 
amounted to no avail. So the only way he felt a change was going to come was via an uprising, a rebellion against the order of the day. So what had happened, there was also a court case going on at the time in St. Thomas, Morant Bay. And when they went back to the courthouse to free the person that was on trial, gunshot was opened on them. And um, it was decided that, you know, no more is going to be stood for. And also armed, they threw bricks, drew their own cutlasses, and one and two of them actually had munition, what they had taken from the powers that be, and armed themselves and retaliated against years and years and years, in fact decades and hundreds of years of oppression, which just was continually going on. So despite the fact that there was the 1807 um, emancipation, and after which there was a further revolt by Sam King, sorry, Sam Sharp. And then after that, the final uprising of Sam Sharp, which brought about the end of slavery and forced the powers to be to reconsider and totally outlaw and abolish slavery, which was some 30 years after emancipation, which brought about the final conclusion of slavery. But 30 odd years later after that, going on another 30 years after that, brought us up to the time of 1865, right. where if you can comprehend the racism, the mindset of um, the Caucasian and Western world powers that be against our people, People as far as as far afield as America, there was problems and atrocities going on. Which, although slavery was outlawed, they didn't want to recognise it, and it actually brought about the um, assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Okay. Okay. And after which time, within a few months of that, I believe that was in 18 the April of that year, 1865, yeah, yeah. and then months after that which drew the conclusion of the american civil war because we had the north south so divide these are all connected correct in history. and this is months later mm. after the assassination of their own president which then finally forced them to accept mm. what was okay. now the end of slavery so putting a timeline on this then we've got this has happened 150 years ago the date being 1865 so if you go back to the um, actual start of the rebellion it was actually the 11th of October, October. 1865 65. what Paul Bogle came back a few days after Paul Bogle came back from Spanish town after petitioning the governor general and events which sparked off into the Morant Bay Rebellion right. uprising which started on the 11th of mm. October 1865 and a lot of our family members are, as a subsequent of the rebellion was actually slaughtered yeah. and whilst the rebellion had gone on taken place and Paul had retreated in hiding because it was obvious and evident that they were after his neck his blood so in hiding what then happened is that they started to round up members, younger members of the Bogle families yeah. and were just slaughtering them until he gave himself up. A lot of life was lost. You know, so irrespective of what you read in history, there's a lot of things that took place and happened what you don't read and will not read about in history. So sharing this with you now, is part of our oral history, family history, what I'm sharing with you, you know, and it's sad. Yeah. So it's how did you get this history? This was taught to me by my father. Growing up, many of us had like, many homes you went to had like a picture of Jesus Christ on the wall and so on and so forth. But in our household, we didn't have none of that. On the wall in our, front room 
took pride of place, the picture of Paul Bogle. So okay. growing up, we knew, knew who, who we were, yeah. you know. And then as I got older, like 12, 13 years old, started to ask my father more and more about our family history, which it was amazing, the history, what my father held and retained and shared with me. So within each family, you'll find a member, one member, one specific member, that will have the oral history of their family and that has been bestowed upon me, which I'm carrying and I've enlightened our family to many things they didn't know and even shared other things when I visited Jamaica many years ago and met and spent time with the great-grandson of Paul Bogle, a cousin named Philip Bogle, yeah. affectionately known as Bagan. Okay. And it was Philip who the statue in St. Thomas was cast off by Edna Manley, who commissioned the statue okay. to mark yeah. the centenary of his yeah. death in 1965. Okay. So the leading up to the 11th of October now, what was going to happen on, what, what happened on that day? As I said, there was a series of meetings and um, some very prominent individuals within this group that for the membership including a Haitian general that Paul Bogle sent out to map Jamaica, Ordnance Survey, which he drafted up of Jamaica. And it was going to be, or it was planned to be, the most organized, orchestrated uprising Jamaica had ever seen. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, and this is a problem that stands today, that whenever there's a plan, someone spills the bean yeah. or leaks what is going to actually happen. And the plan was actually leaked out to the governor general. So they were actually ended up being aware of what was going to happen before it actually happened, but mm -hmm. didn't really think it was going to be as significant as okay. what it was. So Paul actually had meetings with who a group of people known as the Maroons, mm -hmm. and they agreed to side with him and right. join him in the uprising. Okay. What happened on that day? What, what's the build-up and what actually happened on that day? After he had returned from the Governor-General's residence and came back, a lot of things was happening in and around St. Thomas on the day, and um, they actually, the militia actually opened fire on Paul and other members of the community, including, I think, a family by the name of Gio Hagen, whose their mother and sisters within this family was actually shot dead. And if you can imagine the pandemonium and then the retaliation of this taking place sparked off in um, the courthouse, ended up being burnt down the Costas, he was uh, killed along with many of his merry men. And in fact, half of St. Thomas was burnt to the ground, including the courthouse. The significance of what was actually happening, a bounty was put on the head of Paul Bogle, mm -hmm. and it was the highest recorded figure in Jamaican history. Wow on any individual for them, for people to actually give him up or information that would lead to his arrests. But what was actually happening as well, which you won't read or find in history books, is during this time when they were trying to capture and couldn't find Paul Bogle weeks after the armed rebellion, a lot of our family members were paying the price of this, which you wouldn't read in history books and what I'm sharing with you now, that a lot of our family members, the youth, was actually rounded up, captured, and were being slaughtered as a result of the uprising. And they were doing that as punishment to our family. Until to make them give him up. To make them give him up. And the family weren't, we weren't no. going to give him up. They really um, wanted him. Correct. Why do you think that is? They wanted to also set an example and it's similar that happened in Haiti with, for argument's sake, to St. Louis and 
again a treaty was signed or he thought they were going to sign a treaty but they actually captured him when he went to sign the treaty mm -hmm. and imprisoned him where I believe he died. So what and Haiti has intentionally been suppressed as a result of that to date. And similar in Jamaica, you had like a black man that was leading an uprising, a revolt. So the powers that be wanted to stamp it out and make it known that in no way you cannot lift up your hand Mm. or do us anything you know mm. to which we will brutalize you put you down in whichever way we choose to do it to make an example you know but as a result of Paul Bogle and many before him and many after him you could only suppress and hold people down for so long until they will rise Something up happens. and a rebellion is actually what it actually says a rebellion against the mm. order of the day the system yeah. systematic oppression mm -hmm. so okay so we're we're on the 24th now and what history have you been told describe the scene There's family members being sought after because Jean Paul Bogle is you know being looked for he's in hiding so start with telling us where he's hiding well, he fled back to where the um, Bogle hometown was in St. Thomas Stonygut and there was a recess beneath the road where only he and the family members knew of. So when he was in hiding and on one particular day when the Maroons who were sent to capture him was plotting and planning how to flush out the family and how to hopefully find him as far as they were concerned Paul actually heard all what was being planned and was actually one step of them and actually more than one step of them and they could never catch him and they would never knew, know how to catch him because he knew more than what they knew and the planning that was taking place to find him Okay, so tell us at this bit now, what did the Maroons have to do with this? Because up until now we haven't kind of heard about their involvement. So what was their involvement in this whole thing? Well, the Maroons were an independent group of African people living in Jamaica that had fought many rebellions and successful rebellions against the powers that be in Jamaica and was subsequently given their own independence after signing a peace treaty in the late 1730s, the Maroon Peace Treaty. And part of the agreement of that is that they would help to suppress any slave revolt within Jamaica as well as any attack against the island from outsiders from other countries trying to invade and take over control. But this treaty in itself had exhausted and expired because slavery was abolished in the 18, late 1830s, approximately about 100 years yeah. after the Maroon Peace Treaty was yeah. signed. And when Paul Bogle led his uprising, that wasn't an actual slave revolt, it was a civil uprising. So the treaty wasn't in fact worth the paper it was written on, but what had happened at the various meetings that was taking place, known as the Underhill meetings, yeah. somebody that was privileged to be there actually went and betrayed the committee members and went back to the Governor General and conveyed to the Governor General what the intentions were okay. of Paul Bogle and his men. So okay. they sort of was ahead of yeah. what he was going to try and do. Yeah. And although it was orchestrated to be one of the major rebellions in Jamaica that was actually put together with many, many people, including a Haitian general mm -hmm. that knew logistics, ordnance survey, Jamaica was, the landmass of Jamaica was mapped out down to the T. Okay. And it was going to be one of the most um, catastrophic rebellions that Jamaica and the Caribbean had actually seen, but they, the powers that be, had managed to suppress that as a result of an informant that conveyed vital information to them. So the Maroons later on agreed to something in not going with Paul Bogle, in which Mark, in which, um, sorry, 
Bob Marley vocalizes in one of his hit records, So Much Things to Say, mm -hmm. when he addresses Marcus Garvey as well as Paul Bogle, stating that they sold Marcus Garvey for rice and they turned their back on Paul Bogle. So who he's actually making reference to when he said it, they turned their back on Paul Bogle, he's actually making reference to the Maroons mm -hmm. who initially agreed to support Paul, Paul Bogle but later turned their back on him okay. as a result of the treaty that was shown to them what they signed, which in fact wasn't a treaty anymore because the time had passed from that from time. The slavery bit. And yeah. it was no longer. So they actually agreed to something what, was an e which mm -hmm. was now worthless, which had they taken the time and read or you know, gone into what was put to them, mm -hmm. they would have actually backed and gone with Paul Bogle and things could have happened, would have happened a lot Quite quicker different, yeah. and probably more severely for the powers that okay. be. So tell us a bit about, so we was coming through to the 24th of October, 150 years ago, so what's happening in those couple of days and leading up to the 24th, you know, what, what, what does it look like there? I mean, Paul Bogle's in hiding, the family are being sought after and killed, you know, I mean, what, what's, what, what's, what's the sort of build-up now? Take us to the build-up of that now. Well, what happened during over the few weeks and just before what led up to, because Paul Bogle actually was not captured, he gave himself up. Mm -hmm. And this came a few days after his, um, good friend um, Gordon was captured. He was actually arrested, who actually didn't have anything to do with the rebellion. He was actually a very good friend of Paul Bogle and was the individual who actually deaconized Bogle. He had his own church, Baptist church in Kingston. And he was also a moral supporter and advisor of Paul Bogle in aspects of religious principles and so forth, but was a confidant. But somebody fingered him as one of the agitators and he was actually a fawn in the side of the powers that be yeah. because he was a very wealthy individual himself. He was actually the um, co-founder of the Victoria Municipal Bank. Mm -hmm. So he had his own money, he had land and he was a wealthy man, but he was a fawn in the side of the powers that be. Yeah. He, they saw him as an agitator yeah. because he was against what they were doing to the people yeah. and so on and so forth. So they, um, somebody allegedly fingered him as one of the um, culprits yes. of the Morant Bay yeah. uprising. So he was actually taken out of his sick bed because yeah. he actually wasn't, wasn't I think, well. wasn't well. Yeah. And he was actually on his sick bed yeah. when they took him away yeah. from his residence in Kingdom, yeah. Kingston and bought him by ship. In fact, they took him on the uh, HMS Wolverine, which was like um, a naval military ship, mm -hmm. to prevent any few possible um, rescue attempts on him. And, they and that's a lot of expense. That's right. So when you think about that, then they must have really wanted to get at Paul Bogle. Correct, because there was, there was a bounty that was actually placed on his head. Mm -hmm. And it was the most, the highest bounty placed on any individual in Jamaican recorded history throughout the transition of slavery to the end of slavery, be it um, dead or alive, they wanted him. They wanted him, wow. So on the 24th of October now, what happens on that day? Well, prior to the 24th, when they took Brother Gordon away and executed him, on top of what was happening to our family members, Paul's brother Moses, that was conveying information to him, actually told him that half of our family was being slaughtered. And Paul decided with Moses that he was gonna give himself up. And Moses said no. And brother Paul said to Moses that, um, if I don't and they continue to kill our family, who is going to be left and in time to come, mm -hmm. who will tell our story. Mm -hmm. So Paul subsequently gave him up to the Maroons mm -hmm. who signed a peace treaty. With so he gives himself up to the Maroons, not to the correct. officials. So okay. history has recorded that he was captured by the Maroons, which that's incorrect. Yeah. He actually gave himself up. Well, what happened, Paul Bogle was in hiding throughout the day and various hours of the night. 
And where he was hiding, I was actually shown this by a family member when I went to Jamaica in the 90s. In fact, it was the great-grandson of Paul Bogle that showed me where a family member was hiding. And this individual, we affectionately call him Bagan, mm -hmm. but his name is Philip. And it's actually the statue in St. Thomas of Paul Bogle behind the courthouse is actually cast of Philip. Of Philip which okay. is the great-grandson uh -huh. of Paul. And he actually showed me the land, took me for a walk, gave me a further in-depth oral history of our family and actually showed me where Paul was actually hiding. And where he was hiding was like a recess under the road. And it's ironic because when they were, the Maroons were sent out to capture him, he was actually yards away from the maroon and they were none the wiser of where he was mm -hmm. and he was actually hearing plans what, what they were making on. to capture him wow, so wow. he was ahead of them without them even yeah. knowing it but in the end after um his brother moses who unfortunately was also hanged conveyed to him what had happened that they had killed his good friend Gordon, mm -hmm. William Gordon, who I'm actually in communication with members of Go Gordon's okay. family. So the Gordon and Bogle connection is still, still there, there. 150 years on, you know, but um, it was conveyed to him by his brother Moses what was actually happening to the family and that they had actually just recently hung his good friend William Gordon. Mm -hmm. And if you can imagine how disheartened he was because Gordon meant a lot to him. Gordon was actually who actually, and they took him and um, attempted to um, literally kill him, right? And chopped out the entire half of one side of his shoulder and tied him up like a hog on a stake and took him down to um, to Moran the Bay. Courthouse. Correct, to the um, Correct, to hand him over to the powers that be. And when he arrived in um, Morant Bay, he was already half dead. So he actually was captured as a, well. He gave himself up, like I said, tried, convicted, and sentenced to be hung. All right there. Right there. You know, which in the British judiciary system to date states that you have to be fit to face your trial and trial. punishment. Yeah. And even in America, if you're not fit or yeah. you've got any sickness, you ain't gonna be yeah. executed. Yes. But they already had planned what they were gonna do they with him. him and he was um, a serious, serious headache yeah. for the British powers yeah. that be. So they just wanted him And unfortunately, his fate was already sealed. Yeah. So as we remember him now on the 25th, and we kind 24th. of think- 24th. sorry, and we think of the, um, the legacy of Paul Bogle, what do you want people to remember about him? What he stood for, and as a result of um, what he laid his life down for, the liberty of many people, is as we enjoy it today. Before him you had people like Sam Sharp, after him you had brothers like um, Marcus Garvey, who handed the baton over to people like um, Malcolm X, Nelson Mandela, there's many people that have carried the mantle, but it's for us to be treated as equals amongst equals, not to be subordinated, suppressed, and I'd like to just say to our own people that um, wherever we find ourselves or whatever situations or circumstances we find ourselves in, never give up, give up. you know, and we are duty bound yeah to the spirits of our ancestors to be the best we can be yeah, wherever we find be. ourselves and never forget that and so never close. give up. How should we remember him? In the many ways we remember our many martyrs, you know, there's um his day of murder, the twentieth when he actually led well, from when he actually led the uprising on the eleventh of October, which is actually a few weeks time. To the 24th of um, October, October when he was actually hung and killed, you know, it'd be nice to burn a candle for him and not just him, for the many others that stood up beside him and gave their lives and were prepared to give their lives and actually died alongside him and before him. 
many of whom you won't read in history books, you know. His brother Moses was actually hung. His sister Miriam was hung. On the same day? No, days before him they were captured and Miriam and Moses was actually hung on the same day. And his wife's Mary had a son prior to her involvement with Paul and that son saw Paul as more of a father figure than his own father. In fact, Paul had adopted him as his own son and that son was happy to stand beside Paul side by side and Mary's son was also hanged. Many of these things you don't read about, mm -hmm. you won't hear about, but this is um part of our family history, what I'm sharing with you. And mm -hmm. growing up, I always sort of kept this quiet to myself and we kept mm -hmm. it within our family, but you think to yourself, you know what, history is to be shared, you know. I may know a lot of things more than you, but it's not for me to feel superior to you because when my time is gone, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all what I have may end up going in the ground and be buried well, with me. Yeah, you know? So when you share the knowledge, you're keeping absolutely. these things alive. That oral history has to continue. You've got, you know, you were told the story and Correct. I guess the thing is to pass that on now. And in time to come, one of us, our one light, may light many candles in time to come. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. So the legacy now of Paul Bogle, you know, people kind of hear the Morant Bay Rebellion, Paul Bogle and so on. And as you said, Bob Marley um, has kind of mentioned him in his lyrics in a song. Right. Yeah, wh where else do you find that he sort of pops up in, in, in modern speaking now? Well, through people like myself, other family members, and it's actually years ago, I was pleasantly surprised when I was actually on the bus and saw some young school children reading about black history, part of their curriculum. Because when I was growing up in the 70s, none of this was at school. In fact, history was what we taught ourselves. And I grew up amongst, like, my elder brother was a Rastafarian. Mm -hmm. So my influence and teaching and black history came from that to which I further went into and dug deeper and became as many regard me as a, a, a black historian. Yeah, okay. And this is coming from our own teachings, not what was taught to us at the time. So to see um, schools now giving more to our own children in terms of our history, but we still have to teach our own history as to well. our own because yeah. sometimes history is not correctly taught you know it's history is his story yeah. and through you know how they want to convey that mm -hmm. is not necessarily how it should actually be or how actually how it went okay. you know but no teaching can be better than our own tutors and our own teaching our own our history because mm -hmm. that has to be shared and taught by ourselves to indoctrinate our own and others who embrace it okay so we're now 150 years on from the 24th of October. And what message would you personally like to kind of give in remembrance and also to people to just kind of get that history and get that right? And, and I guess in some way, what is the resistance today? What's that re revolt about? What's the rebellion about today? Well, we are actually still under and up against a lot of oppression as black people. Morant Bay Rebellion in 1865, what started to happen, like I explained, is a lot of our family members, the younger family members, was actually being slaughtered and killed off until they found or Paul Bogle gave himself up. And even way after the rebellion, decades after the rebellion of 1865, if you went for any job in authority, you just wouldn't get it. When they heard that your name was Bogle, you weren't getting it. So to sort of move on and try and better themselves, a lot of our family members had to change their name from Bogle and adopt their mother's maiden name. So within our family, you got like um, Macphersons, Stuarts, Lightborns. So a lot of the family members took on their mother's maiden name and it's it's strange because even like the name Lightborn is coming from Bogle and 
during the independence of Jamaica in, 18, in 1962, the music that was compiled for Jamaica's national anthem was actually written by Robert Lightbourne, who is actually a bogle. You know, but it's also to recognize who we are, not who we are told we are, and to search ourselves, because many of us, unfortunately, have no record or date of who we are, where we come from, our lineage. And believe it or not, a lot of our people have royal lineage within ourselves that has been lost, you know. So what I'd like to say to our people is something what Paul Bogle held, something what he then passed on, because one candle lights many. So Paul Bogle is coming off the shoulder, as you can say, of Sam Sharp, who led a rebellion decades prior to that. After Paul Bogle came Marcus Garvey. After Marcus Garvey came Malcolm X, now, it's interesting because Malcolm X's father was actually a follower of Marcus Garvey. Mm -hmm. So you've got the continuity of the teaching. And through this, you then, at this time of um, Malcolm X, you've also got the resistances going on, as I explained earlier on, in various parts of Africa. So you had then people like Nelson Mandela carrying the light. And also, um, Nkrumah was the first president of the first African state within Ghana. Mm -hmm. So you've got many people that is carrying the love and light. Yes, yes. You know, so it's also for us today to be the best we can be wherever we find ourselves yeah. or whatever circumstances we find ourselves because... What we need to remember and reflect upon occasionally, not just in Black History Month, but through our day-to-day -day movements, is that we are actually duty-bound to the spirits of our ancestors to be the best we can be wherever we find ourselves. Because if it wasn't for their resilience, we would basically not be here today. Mm. You know, So whatever pressure or stress we may find ourselves on today, so, it's nothing, mm -hmm. you know, In if you can reflect or try to reflect on what our ancestors was up against, what they had to endure, their conditions, the beatings, working some horrific hours, sometimes 16, 18 hours a day in blazing heat, not being paid, treated worse than dogs, mm -hmm. you know, it to sit down and try and comprehend and take that in is a lot. It is a lot. So we owe it to our ancestors. Yes. You know, we're duty bound to them to yeah. be the best we can be. Yeah, and continue with and that love and light. And continue love and light. Mm, well, Junior Bogle, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for sharing. And I have to kind of give admiration to you for just kind of the fortitude and thinking that you've had to just kind of keep that family story, remember it and tell it. And Thank push you. push for that. So the 150 years on, we want to kind of just give thanks to that life. And now we're going to talk to Junior about the picture of Bogle, its authenticity, and also about these rebellions and the drums and our genealogy. So let's get into it. When you were saying that they conspired with the Haitian government, that was like declaration of global world war. Right. And then also, um, prior to that, the uprisings what took place, they were beating drums. And if you can imagine hundreds of and hundreds of drums being beaten, right? Drums is how our ancestors communicated. So now anytime we hear music, we just start to stamp our feet. We don't know, but we just kind of get connected, right? And this was our ancestral language. And when our ancestors then was beating the drums. And if you can imagine hundreds of drums being beaten and the vibration through the land, through the sea to other Caribbean islands and other places, right? They were picking up the same frequency and the, the powers that be could not to this day understand, understand how we communicated 
to rise up simultaneously in different parts of the Caribbean at the same time. <gasps> Check that. And furthermore, we don't understand, but we kind of, we don't need to understand, we feel. So there's certain times you will go and hear African drummers or people play, our own people that's tuned in playing African drums. Even like um, music, Fela Kuti, James Brown, they just had a unique rhythm where you hear a type of music, you know that's James Brown. You don't even have to ask questions, right? And even if you may not really have grown up on that, you just start to stamp your feet and you, you just go into the... It's like you've tuned in and signed on. You've, log, you've logged on, right? The other thing that's very interesting is the connection that is made between just with this Mary Seacole, this famous nurse, she practiced her nursing in Panama, the West Indies, and the Crimean War. And didn't I tell you in my videos on the Crimean War that there was a connection between the global Hebrew world wars and the Russians and the Crimeans. They were all fighting for the Hebrews, it seems. And they, the Russians even supported the Hebrews in Ethiopia and all the way down into South Africa. So there's a definite connection that is now revisiting today as we see Putin in his speech mentioning race over and over and over again. He mentions it about midway through his speech and he compares the discrimination towards Russia to racism and he talks about no longer tolerating racism. And this is of great interest because this is telling you that the Eastern Europeans, notice how the Western Europeans would always look down on the Eastern Europeans. The reason for that is because the Western Europeans are the Canaanites. They've been roped. They were the people who were roped off. The Eastern Europeans are Gentiles. They're Japheth. Now, that's not 100% across the board because you can just look at the people and a lot of them, you can see the Ukrainians and obviously the Ashkenazis and everything are, um, are Canaanites and Horites, etc. But the truth is, is that that is truly the land of Japheth, Eastern Europe. And the Canaanites do separate themselves into Western Europe. And they're clearly dominating the Hebrew Empire by dominating Western Europe. And so have a look again at this gravestone, and it just clearly demonstrates to you that these, the Israelites, this famous nurse, was fighting wars all the way from Panama to the West Indies, all the way to Crimea as a unified body. And so I'm going to do another piece on this stuff. This is those histories, uh, but the Hebrew, and more on the Hebrew world wars, but this is definitely a connection that has to be made and has to be understood. And I'm so grateful to my ancestors who died uh, in this battle and who sought to overcome the enemy that was in the British and the other nations who took Israel captive, Israel the elect, to the four corners of the earth. So this is why this, it, <clears throat> so this article, or so Putin's speech actually says, this is why the choice of people in the Crimea, Crimea Stavispol, etc., etc., causes wild anger in them. The West has no moral right to elevate it, even to stutter about the freedom of democracy. No, and never was. Western elites die, deny not only the national sovereignty and international law, their hegemony has a pronounced character of totalitarianism, despotism, and apartheid. See, there it is. And they brazenly divide the world into their vassals, into so-called civilized countries, into and into all the rest who, according to the plan of today's Western, here we go, racists, should add to the list of barbarians and savages. 
false labels, rogue country authoritarian regime, regime, so this is what they're calling Russia, are already ready. They stigmatize entire peoples and states, and there is nothing new in this. There is nothing new in this. The Western art elites are what they were and have remained so. Colonialists, in other words, parasites, they colonize other people's things, bodies, nations. They discriminate. So we've got apartheid, we've got racism, we've got discrimination here. They discriminate, divide peoples into the first and other grades. Okay. We have never accepted and never will accept such political nationalism, and here we go again, racism. And what if not racism is Russia phobia? So he's saying Africans. I'm saying being phobic against Russians, and they are phobic against Russians as Eastern Gentiles of Japheth, not fallen angels of the Canaanites. They're racist against them because they're Japheth, okay? although there's Canaanites mixed in for sure. Russia phobia, which is now spreading all over the world. What if not racism is the paramatory conviction of the West that is civilization? The necliberial culture <laughs> is an indisputable model for the whole world? He who is not with us is against us even sounds strange. Even their repentance for their own historical crime, crimes is being shifted by the Western elites to everyone else, demanding both the citizens of their countries and other people to confess what they have nothing to do with at all. For example, the period of colonial conquest. So now he's, he's saying to the American citizens, your government's responsible for colonialism, not necessarily the individuals. Well, systemically, yeah, the individuals are, and then there's a small remnant who aren't. I don't agree with that. It is worth reminding the West that it began its colonial policy back in the Middle Ages and then followed the global slave trade, the genocide of the Indian tribes in America. So those, those are indigenous Japheth, right, mixed with Canaan the plunder of India, Africa, the wars of England, France against China, and as a, as a result of which it was forced to open ports, etc., etc. So I just wanted you to hear the whole racism thing here, all right? That's what he's emphasizing. That's what he's selling and marketing. And of course, you know, China is oppressing uh, Africa, but you know what? The Chinese here in Canada are just really lovely. I love that. The Chinese here are so nice, family. Um, and even when they're in, they were in China with all of China's racism, the Chinese Canadians are, were very, and Americans really stood up for black people. So I have to say that. That is very true. And I, I had a number of friends who were Chinese. So I'm not just saying that to suck up. It's just true. They're really nice. <laughs> Almost my whole building is Chinese people, and they're all wonderful to me, so I don't know what to tell you. So here is our family genealogy. So here are the descendants of Paul Bogle, and this is really the last contact we have, which is a kind of strange connection. Here is Robert Charles Lightborn. These are the Bogles. This was the last connection we have, but it's very odd. And so this is my grandmother's side of the family. And but like Junior said, they use the women's names to hide themselves, right? Shall a woman encompass a man, right? So uh, Elizabeth Bogle and Henry McPherson. Then come down here to my grandmother Daisy McPherson and then my mother and my aunt Jan so she had two daughters so my grandfather and grandmother only had two daughters there were no other children and so this is our family lineage and then of course from my mother it goes down here even further but we're not going to get into that because I haven't gotten permission to show that and then 
Charles, Jeremiah, Edwin, Joseph, and Louisa, they're all Bogles on the other end. And my cousin, Junior, comes. he will clarify the rest of the genealogies because we're still trying to figure that out as a family. This is as much as was collected by my aunt and godmother, Aunt Pansy, who has been working on this genealogy and written books on how to track your genealogy in Jamaica. So here's the article from 2008 with my uh, Aunt Pansy Robinson from Jennifer O'Sullivan. And they're discussing how to research your family records in Jamaica and find your family roots. So this is what my Aunt Pansy was working on for years, okay, to find our way back to the family genealogy. Well, um, let me go back a little further you? for you, um, John, because I don't know if you've been able to go beyond this. Well, if you just slide left, uh, slide, slide to what I have, what I have at the top of my tree is Andrew Bogle. Correct. And yeah, Charles Bogle, his father was Andrew Bogle, but Correct. I think there are several Andrew Bogles, Correct. and I don't yes. know which one it is. But their father yeah. was Andrew Bogle, and I've got his wife's name mixed, written down somewhere, and that okay. came to me by chance. But yes. Andrew's father, his name also was Andrew, and right. the first of our line was sold, he was born in 1785. Yes. And in 1812, he was sold in slavery, into slavery in Jamaica and held on the Norris estate. I don't know if okay. you're familiar with that. No, no. And then he had his son in, I think, 1825. And that is the Andrew Bogle who is on your list there, who had okay. three children. Um, um Jeremiah, Elizabeth, and Charles, and Charles. who's referred okay. to as Chaz. No. Leave Jeremiah died in 1916 from okay. memory. Okay. So, okay. 19... okay. There is some crazy story with an Andrew Bogle who, who has a son named Andrew Bogle. And they have this. This is what I was trying to explain to John. What the, um, the, Europeans do is they hide the the black aristocracy and heroes behind slave stories that they're slaves. So I found mm -hmm. this weird story about this this Andrew Bogle who had a son named Andrew Bogle. So the Berbers or the Israelites of the Northern Kingdom in Europe, and of course the Edomites, the black Edomites of Eastern Europe were the indigenous black people in that region and the aristocracy there. But the BBC will do a documentary or the Gentiles who live there now saying things like, oh, you know, this guy, Mr. Barber, was a slave who freed himself. He was born a slave. And then he became a free man in that area. And then he had various wives who were white and that's how we got the white Georgian population. They were just kind of bred out by the white people, which is true, which can happen. White people can over three generations or more breed the black out of black people. But this is often the case where a slave story, a slave narrative is told to cover up a true story of Arist black Negro aristocracy or some kind of a political or social victory. Remember, the scripture says that neither the scepter nor a lawgiver will depart from between the feet of Judah. So there will always be a successful descendant of Israel who is black, who is a king and a priest or a lawgiver. And so I, why do I give you this example? Well. Because there's supposed to be an Andrew Bogle who I think, um, I'm not sure whether it's erroneous or not, but is listed in my family genealogy. Lightborn had said that he was a direct descendant of Bogle. We didn't know what to do for, with the history at this point. And so, interestingly enough, there's this whole narrative 
about a man named Andrew Vogel that crops up around a particular time. Now, I want you to look at this photo to see when this photo was taken in England. And this man, Andrew Vogel, traveled all over England and he even traveled to Australia. And his descendants are supposed to remain in Jamaica, yet the last place where he was seen was Britain. So it's a rather curious story that I believe may be another cover story because you see this man, he's well clothed, he's well dressed, and there are clear photographs of him by a professional photographer. But yet he is categorized as a slave and his whole identity is defined in relation to some scandal tied to a plantation owner. So it just, just seems, I mean, they go into his, into detail, into his whole genealogy. Okay, his wives he married, children he had, divorces, who he had here. They go, we're going to this whole kind of spurious genealogy. The story is not, it, it, they barely go into the story about the scandal of the actual plantation owner that he worked with and the estate that was in dispute. They go into this rigorous genealogy of this servant who stood behind somebody who was falsely, a white person who was falsely claiming an inheritance of a plantation. And this Bogle man was supposed to be the, I guess you could say, representative um, who would stand up to identify this young man as the inheritor. And he was never jailed or anything, although the man was put in jail. So it's just a very odd story. And you have to wonder why so much attention was paid to this man and why there would be wood carvings. So these are wood, this wood etchings and numerous photographs of this particular man who was just a Negro slave. And we come back to this clearly black aristocrat from Georgia. And we know the Ivanovs were black in those regions, the royalty, but yet he was a slave. And so I'm thinking that this might be another situation, another whitewash cover up because his genealogy is so emphasized and because of the number of photos of him, him that exist and even a woodcut, which is quite expensive. And it seems that he's moving around and traveling around in the mid 1800s, okay? What Europeans do is they hide the, the black aristocracy and heroes behind slave stories, that they're slaves. I'm aware yeah. of the story. Because I think it's- Andrew Bogle, he's on, in the book, by an author named J.A. Rogers. I don't know if you're familiar with that yes. author, Nature Knows No Color Line. Yes. What is the connection, as you best you know, between either one of those Andrew Bogles to Paul Bogle? Well, my father said they were cousins, but he didn't know. At the time, he didn't know of Andrew Bogle. That was his father's father. No, no, no. His father's grandfather was Andrew Bogle. But he didn't know that. He only knew from Jeremiah, Charles, and Elizabeth. But after right. my, but after my father died, I managed to go back two generations to Andrew Vogel and Andrew's father, who also was Andrew Vogel. And it was him in 1812 that was sold into slavery from the Gold Coast. And it, okay. and it was him but, that. But was, you haven't established the connection to Paul. No. Vogel. All he Perfect. said was that okay. they were cousins. Okay. okay. So I need to find out Andrew's um, siblings and his father's siblings. Yeah. But they were held on the Norris estate. The first Andrew that was enslaved was held on the Norris estate. Yeah. And then the Bogles were moved around west, I mean, um, okay. the west. No, the east side of Jamaica, as you know, is St. Thomas. Yeah. And then what also happened, what I didn't know until I found out in documents, 
um, the plant, the main two planters, um, slave owners, was Archibald Bogle and his um, attorney by the name of Rennie Strachan. I don't know if you're familiar with those names. No, no, mm -mm, no. Well, mm. Archibald Bogle was the main enslaver of Bogle's, and then his son, I can't remember his son, but his okay. son then took it over. Yeah. And then they're, they're at, who I believe to be their attorney. I can't yeah. remember his first name, but his surname was a double barrel, Rennie Strachan. And he okay. also, and then they shared the, 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 slave, the slave plantations. Yeah. And then you had some of this, our family that was moved yeah. up to Cedar Valley, Trinityville. And um, I'm going off the top of my head from memory okay. what my father should. Yeah. And then you had other families out as far as Bath and down in Morant Bay and Spring yeah. Garden. Okay. And, and then you also had bogles that were taken away to Grenada. Now, I've never come across a bogle <laughs> or, a, or a Grenadian that's a bogle, okay. but I actually okay. found documentary proof of that. And then okay. after the abolition of slavery, a lot of the bulk, because they were bought backwards and forwards between Jamaica and Grenada to work plantations. Right. But Jeremiah was the oldest. I believe Charles came next and then Elizabeth. And okay. their lineage going out to um, Macpherson, yeah. Lightborn, and right. um, ba Bailey. And, um... So we will we will be finalizing the genealogy because it's uh, written down. So we're just working, all working on it together. So it was just really exciting. And I'm so grateful for my cousin <laughs> Junior for just, you know, meeting up with us and talking to us about that stuff. And um, he's not a Hebrew, but man, he took it on pretty easily. And this was his experience with Christianity, which is kind of interesting to me because it's very clear that he just knows who he is, and um, I just pray he continues on the path. And he was very receptive to a lot of what I'm teaching, so I'm grateful for that. But, you know, we'll see what happens, so I ask you to pray for him. But, yeah, this, these were his thoughts on the Bible when he was young. The, the, the story of the Bible, as my sister would say, the corners don't meet, right? <laughs> and my first question to people, even at 16, 18, sorry, I was invited to church to reason with a priest because he liked my questionings and he said it's good to have questions. But unbeknown to me at the time, he was trying to convert me to be a recruiter in his church. And after five weeks of sessions, he told me we're wasting each other's time. Because, he <laughs> could, because at 18, he could, yeah. because at that age, he couldn't answer the questions what I was firing at him. And one of which was what is the first country mentioned in the Bible? And I asked him if he's aware of that. And he came out with a whole round of things. And I said, I'm asking you a specific question. And it seems like you don't know, but the first country mentioned in the Bible is actually Africa, which in the Bible is referred to as Ethiopia. And depending on which Bible you read, it will have different titles. But Ethiopia was Ethiopia was one of the original names of Africa and mm. it's not how it was now. Ethiopia is just a now a segment of what That's it okay. previously was because it covered. And I said prior to that, no, after that, the amount of times Africa has been retitled and renamed. And one of the last names before it was carved up by the disgruntled Europeans at the 1887 birth infamous Berlin conference, mm -hmm. it was called Akobulen, where there was only about four sections to Africa, the top, the bottom, the third, and the south. Yeah, we've been a blessing to each other in many ways, because, oh. yeah? Yes, you are a major blessing to me. Major. I mean, Thank I feel you. like I just got, like... It was supposed to be. No, every, all will happen is in its appointed time. Yeah. And as you said, now is the time. Yeah.
So listen, I'm here, right? And whenever we meet up, we've got so much time to spend. And I hope I can either come to Canada or you can come over or somehow we connect wherever we connect. And it's so much, right? Yeah. The, the big hug I'll give you, not squeeze life out of you, squeeze life into you. Yes. Yeah? Yes. Hallelujah. Suba Yahuwah Rev Alep Yasharel. Suba Yahuwah Rev Alep Yasharel. Return, O Yahuwah, to the countless thousands of Israel. Thank you everyone for your donations and support. It means a lot. And subscribe or simply become a member in 2altruth.net to get updates on videos. Suba Yahua Rev Alep Yasharel. Suba Yahua Rev Alep Yasharel. Return, O Yahua, to the countless thousands of Israel. And let those that hate thee flee from before thee. Let all of Yasharah, Yisrael, who love, worship, and praise Yahweh, give him thanks by saying hallelujah. <laughs>